Hebrews chapter 5 tonight. Hebrews in chapter 5. And then also, uh, we'll be briefly in Psalm 110. And so if you want to just mark it or be ready to turn there, but uh, that will be our other text that we'll look at this evening, which of course, Hebrews chapter 5 references. Hebrews chapter 5. Now, a couple of things. Uh, as we, we'll, we'll read our text, I guess, and then we'll make some commentary. So Hebrews chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse 1 and, and read ourselves right down to uh, verse 5. So, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So now we'll pray. Father, please help us this evening with our understanding as we go to the Scripture and as we look at this reason why Jesus Christ is worthy of being worshipped and why it would be wrong for any person to go away uh, from Jesus Christ as our High Priest. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're in our study in Hebrews, and I believe it's been a very rewarding one. Hebrews, of course, is written to Jewish believers who are struggling in their faith and they are considering going back from following Jesus or they have already gone back from following the Lord Jesus because of the difficulty of the Christian life. And you know the prosperity gospel folks ought to read Hebrews sometime to see why it is we live for Jesus. We do not live for Jesus because of all the things that God does for us. Uh, we live for Jesus because of what Christ once did for us and because of who we are in Jesus Christ. But I don't need to be made healthy or wealthy in order to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I have everything in Christ. I am everything in Jesus Christ. And all that I have is all that I need. And so oftentimes, uh, we try to persuade or convince believers that the reason that they follow the Lord Jesus Christ is because of what God will do for them. And it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? That we serve the kind of God that wants to do wonderful things for us. Sometimes we can be overly pious in the rebuking individuals who, who want God to do things for them. You know, well, being saved is enough. We know God doesn't owe us anything. Well, God never did owe us anything to begin with. And yet God is a very, very beneficent Father. He's a great benefactor who desires to do things for us. Matter of fact, even commands us to ask Him and to pray and ask Him for things. And the Bible says that anything we ask according to His will, we know we have the petitions that we desire of Him. So He's a good God who wants to do good things for us, but that isn't why we follow Jesus. We follow Jesus because He's the only means for salvation. Jesus Himself said to His disciples, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And so these struggling Hebrew Christians are considering or have already gone back into Judaism. And they are worshiping, they thank God, by the way of Judaism because being a Christian is too difficult. Not only are you persecuted for being Jewish, and not only is uh, Jerusalem and, and uh, every Jewish outpost about to be annihilated by the Roman government because of rebellion. Literally, we are uh, somewhere between a half to two years away from the sacking of Jerusalem. And so things are rough politically. Things are imminent. Destruction of Jerusalem is imminent. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And not only is it difficult being Jewish, just nationally, but it's compounded by being a Jewish believer who then has his own family, his own brothers, his own sisters, his own father, his own mother disown him and become his enemies. It's not fun to be alone at all, is it? You ever felt as though you're all alone? And the reality of it is, is that oftentimes you're less alone than you think. You know, if you're a member of a local church, if you're just, uh, if you're just an involved member of a local church, you're not very alone. You just aren't. 
If you're in a good church, you're not alone at all. You may feel alone on a day when you get to feeling sorry for yourself and you know, and uh, just you know, feed those passions or those thoughts. But the reality of it is you're not alone. No one is. But you know, the Jewish believers, if they got saved, when it came to everything they had before they came to Jesus, they're alone. Uh, their countrymen had forsaken them. And also, not only had their countrymen forsaken them, but their own families had turned against them. And then on top of that, no one else wanted them. Except for Jesus. Except for Jesus. And the Holy Spirit writes this letter to believers, and I just think about how sweet and how loving God is to in His Word give us, or include in His Word, a letter that urges us not to go back from following Him. And that gives us good reasons why we ought to go forward in serving Jesus. And good gives us good reasons for why we ought to be afraid not to go forward in serving Jesus. And so we've looked at warning passages in Hebrews. We look first of all at the good reason not to go back from following Jesus in chapters 1 and 2. And that is that if you go back into Judaism, you're going to go back into exalting angels into worshiping angels and making a big deal about angelic beings who have names and who supposedly uh, have you know areas of power and so forth. But Jesus is better than the angels. God never said to any of the angels, sit thou here until I make thine enemies thy footstool. But God said that to Jesus. Said that to His Son. God never said to the angels, thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. But God said that to His Son, Jesus. So Jesus is better than the angels. Not only is Jesus better than the angels, but because of the fact that He called us brethren. We are His brethren. We've become heirs together with Jesus Christ, and God has made us better than the angels, higher than the angels. Now how ridiculous is it for a higher being to worship a lower one? You don't bow to something below you. You bow to something above you. And so the believers are urged, it makes no sense at all to go back from following uh, Jesus, to go back to worshiping angels. And then the warning was, oh, and remember what happened when the angels turned against God? God's justice. God didn't go back. His, his judgment was steadfast against the angels. Chapter 2 when they rebelled against Him, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You better be careful because God is not playing. God's not playing. And so there's the warning and then there's the uh, kind urging for believers. You know, God uses both. I love Jude's illustration, the last part of Jude after the warning against false teachers and false doctrine is the and if some have compassion, making a difference, and the others save with fear. You know what? There's the compassionate appeal in Hebrews, and then there's the you better look out appeal. And so whichever one you are, you know, if you're a parent, you know the difference in your children, don't you? You know, you have the you have the child that you just have to talk to. And when they understand and they realize what they've done, I mean they just, you know, they're very tender hearted and they feel terrible about it. And talking to will handle it. And then there's the one that's got to be made afraid. Because they don't have the natural fear they ought to. And I'm not going to say which of my siblings uh, we compared that way with, but there was a sibling that I had that needed fear in order to uh, be saved from the fire and probably didn't get enough fear, I'm afraid. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that that's the way God appeals to us. And then we saw uh, the comparison of Moses. If you go back into Judaism, chapter 3 and chapter 4, then you're going to go back into Moses and the law of Moses being everything. When we use the name or when we talk about Moses, the implied uh, under the, 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 what is implied there is the law of Moses as well. So when we talk about Moses or the Jews talk about Moses, we know that we're also talking about the law. You remember the rich man in hell? And you remember when he asked for his brethren to go back and to, uh, or I'm sorry, for Lazarus to go back and warn his brethren? What was what was Abraham's response? They have Moses. Moses and the prophets. So what is he talking about? They have Moses. Was Moses still alive? No, but the Word of God, Moses, was still alive. And so we're talking about two things when we talk about Moses. We're talking about the person Moses, 
But we're also talking about God's Word, Moses, that is the law of God, that you go back to. And we're reminded that if you want to go back to Moses, Moses was a great fellow. He was faithful in all his house, but we're also reminded uh, that he didn't enter into the lay into rest. You can go back into worshiping Moses, but you'll never, you'll never finish it. You go back into the law, my friend. How long do you have to keep the law for? When are you ever finished? When you take a break from the law, you never do. And who's ever kept the law? No one ever has. Who's fulfilled the law? Only Jesus. And so we're told that Jesus Christ is superior to Moses. But then we're told that the problem with the children of Israel when they had Moses... So remember the children of Israel when they had Moses? And God gave them Moses to lead them out of the promise of land. And God was with them in a pillar or a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then, when they had wandered in the wilderness for so long a time, they did not enter into rest. And the reason they did not enter into rest is because when they sent the spies, remember this? What's the final thing that aggravated God? They sent the spies into the land and all, all of them came back of course, we know Caleb and Joshua gave a true report, but the ten spies said, you know, they're giants. You know, they, we're like grasshoppers compared with them. Yes, the land is great, but there's no way in the world we could ever occupy that land. And they told God that. The same God who had brought them out of Egypt with a strong hand. Who do you think was greater <coughs> military might-wise? Pharaoh? or the Canaanites? I have a guess as to the answer to that question, don't you? There's not a lot of Canaanite world history. <laughs> you know? Uh, I have a guess about that, don't you? Who brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand? Well, Moses led them, but God's the one that did it. How'd they get through the Red Sea and escape Pharaoh's army? God led them. How were they sustained all those years as they wandered in the wilderness? Where did they get water from? God gave them manna and quail, and God made water come out of whatever He wanted it to, whenever He wanted it to. And if the water was bitter, God made it sweet. Who made it so that their sandals never wore out? Who was with them, urging them to go into the promised land? And the answer is God. And so in all of chapter 4, we see that God was not pleased with the children of Israel because their, they, it was not mixed with faith. In other words, the matter that angered God with the children of Israel was they said, well, God, I don't think you can take us into the promised land. Now, while we're considering that, think on this, will you please? Who's being addressed? Again, individuals that have said, you know, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He's the Savior of the world. And I want to receive Him as my Savior. And now they're saying, you know, I believe that, God, but this is a real problem here in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, when the rubber meets the road, there's a lot of conviction here for us, isn't there? How often do we believe God for the most important things and not believe Him for the least of things? And the Bible says God was not pleased with them because they were not mixed with faith, the ones that heard. And you want to talk about something that makes God angry. It's unbelief. Unbelief infuriates Almighty God. And we're warned about that. And my friend, I'll tell you something. I need this sometimes, don't you? I need this sort of warning. When I don't believe God, when I take matters into my own hands, how often do believers say something like, I know God's Word says... What's the next word? But... You know what that is? Unbelief. Unbelief. Which is the same as rebellion. God hates it. And so we saw that a couple weeks ago, and now we'll get into tonight's text, and we'll just look at a couple of things. Now we're going to see that we're, we're still in the same vein of thought, transitioning from Moses, uh, because Moses was from which tribe? Hmm? Yeah. Thank you, Joel. No. Levi. He would have been from the same one as, you Levi. said Eli? Levi. Levi. Oh, Levi. I thought you said, all right. 
Yeah, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, right? Moses was from the tribe of, of Levi. And what was significant about that? What did that signify? They were priests. Well, God made them priests. And so Moses actually, in a way, was a priest. His brother Aaron was the high priest, but Moses was one of the priests because he was from the tribe of Levi. And as a priest, Moses had responsibilities, privileges, and things that he could do for the children of Israel. And so we're going to see the description of a priest. We're going to see a, a priest contrasted with Jesus, who is better than a priest in chapter 5. You see the vein of thought? We're still talking about Moses, but now we're talking about Moses as a priest, and we're going to transition in the next several chapters to talking about other priests. Of course, in, and we'll be in Melchizedek, mentioning Melchizedek by next week. Here's a statement about a priest. And by the way, if you, ever, if you know someone who's in a religion, ask them what a priest is. And then take them to Hebrews chapter 5 and ask them if the priest that they look to qualifies. First of all, every priest, every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God. Now that's a mouthful, but it means a lot, doesn't it? Every high priest taken from men, uh, from among men, is ordained for men uh, in things pertaining to God. So what is the purpose of a high priest? Well, he's just he's taken from men. Of course, we know he's got to be Levitical, Levite. And he's ordained for the benefit of men, spiritual things, right? He's supposed to deal with them for things to God. Remember the deal that the children of Israel made with Moses when they were by the mount and the mount was smoking and they said, we're afraid of the presence of God. What was the deal they made with, with Moses? So tell you what, Moses, you talk to God for us, and whatever God says, we'll do, but God's presence is too terrible for us. So the priest was a buffer between God and man because man is too afraid to come into the presence of God. You know, tragically, we've lost some of the fear of God in that sense. I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing that they wanted Moses instead of directly having a relationship with God. But I do think it's tragic that we've lost some fear of God. But the reason we're not so afraid of God is because of our high priest, who is the Son of God, who has broken down the barriers between God and us. He's taken God's wrath, the perspective of God that is His wrath against us. Jesus Christ has taken the full force of that and taken it out of the way for holy God. And so Moses was the guy that stood between man and God. But he was just a man. And here are some weaknesses with Moses we'll begin to see right in the beginning. Uh, first of all, we're told that one of the things that was good about him, verse 2, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Do you know enough about God? Do you know enough about God? Will you ever? <laughs> I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that man's limited, isn't he? You know, the Satan who could quote the Word of God, Jesus quoted right back at him. See, our high priest Jesus Christ, who is from heaven, our high priest knew the Word of God and knew it in context as well as out. You know, a priest is probably not right about everything. I shouldn't I should use the present tense. I should say a priest probably was not right about everything. Certainly, we look in the period of the judges when God was using priests and we see examples like we're seeing on Sunday night like Eli and like Samuel, who had major flaws. And men are flawed. But one of the advantages of a man being flawed is that if he realizes that, he can have compassion on the ignorant, and he can be, have compassion on the person who's out of the way. Out of the way means a person who isn't right. <laughs> you know, I'd like to take this passage of Scripture and I like to just preach it by itself to some self-righteous Christians. Ah, there isn't anything at all wrong with taking the Word of God and lovingly going to a brother and showing them what they may not know or showing them what they are not heeding. 
and as a brother or sister pleading with them to obey God's Word, and even as a church uh, with God's authority, uh, holding it against them or holding it to them to be in fellowship with God. But my friend, one of the things about people that I can always understand is, is sin. It is, it, 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 uh, it's a little shocking for me when a Christian says, I don't know how anyone could do that. You ever met that? I don't know how anyone could do that. Well, the truth of the matter is it may not appeal to you in particular, but you know anyone could do just about anything, and that's evidenced by some of the things you do, and I don't know how you can do that. Isn't it so? It's incredible how believers oftentimes act as though they cannot relate. I saw a post on social media um, this week. <coughs> And it was by an individual that was basically publicly confessing that what they preached they weren't living. And they said, I'm going to stop preaching until I can live it. Well, I think just get right and go forward at that time. But you know what? That's kind of good, isn't it? When someone realizes, you know, that oftentimes a person who's barking the loudest is covering the biggest whatever. You know, I've seen that, I've seen that to be true oftentimes among believers. Individuals who are railing against others are oftentimes found to be in sin themselves. One thing about a high priest taken from among men is at least he understood that you were a sinner because he was too. And that made him relatable in that sense, but it didn't qualify him. Made him relatable, but it didn't qualify him. And so we begin to see the contrast with the Lord Jesus though. Now, I want to ask a question before we... Uh, well, let's look at verse 3. By reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. We're going to see the contrast between a priest who needed to offer sacrifice and gifts for his own sins versus Jesus Christ who was the offering for others' sins. See, before a high priest could offer uh, for the sins of others, he had to offer for himself. And that's the problem with a priest. Is he's just as flawed as any man because he is just a man. He's taken from men. Now, let me ask you a question. This is just mostly for you to think on. Why is it that Jesus was not a Levite? Why is it that David, why is it the king of Israel that had the Messianic seed promise was not taken from the Levites? You ever wonder that question? Saul was a Benjamite, and did not the Scripture say, did did not Samuel say to Saul that if he hadn't rebelled, that God would have established his throne forever? David uh, was from the tribe of Judah. Judah. And so that's the tribe we're adopted into because we have the position of Jesus Christ. But if Jesus is the high priest, why was he not a Levite? You ever think on that? You ever ask that question? Why was Jesus not a Levite? Would He not have been better qualified to be our high priest if He were a Levite? You know, there's some wonderful answers in it, and wonderful and simple answers to it. The first of which is that had Jesus been a Levite, then He would have been much more limited to be a priest for Israel and not a priest for everyone. In other words, Levites were the priests for national Israel. But Jesus, my friend, superseded that. He was greater than that. And that's why we're going to see in the next couple of weeks Melchizedek was a greater priest. Why Abraham, who had the seed of the Levites in his bowels, offered a sacrifice to Melchizedek and why Melchizedek was greater than Abraham because of the scope of their ability to minister. In other words, think on this, my friend. It's always been God's plan through Jesus Christ to not only save national Israel, and don't, don't make too much of the way I said that, but to not only save Israel, but to save the nations of the earth. Jesus was better than the Levites, better equipped. Oh, you could become an Israelite, but you were always limited to where you could go in the temple. A proselyte couldn't go into the same places 
that a natural Jew, a born Jew, could go into, or a born Israelite could go into. And so what we see is that Jesus was greater than, greater than Israel, greater than Abraham. He was greater than that in the same way that Melchizedek was a greater high priest than that. Verse 4, we're going to look at who Jesus is and what honor God had given him. No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. And I said to you that you could talk to individuals that call themselves priests, and you could ask them the question, who called you? Who called you to be a priest? You know who calls priests in, the, in Catholicism? They call themselves. That's who calls a priest. A young man decides, I've, I've interviewed priests before. What made you want to be a priest? Well, I, you know, I didn't ever think I would be, but I was kind of a loser in life, and, and things didn't work out otherwise, so I became a priest. <laughs> that was mean, wasn't it? I wish I could say I'm sorry, but it was just too true to apologize for. I, so I've just met a lot of guys that couldn't do anything else that became priests. Uh, I've met some preachers that I think the same is true of as well. So I'll qualify with that. Okay? And so I will have to say that there's a difference between being called by God and being called because there's nothing else you could do or because it's what you decided you were going to do. But the Bible says a true priest is called by God. A true priest is called by God. But then the Bible goes on to say, He that is called of God as was Aaron. But then, in verse 5, gets us to our final point this evening. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son today, have I begotten thee. Do you think that it was the son's desire? I don't want to get into the intricacies of the Trinity this evening because it goes beyond my, beyond my intellect and yours too, unfortunately. But no one who became a high priest, or no, the fact that Jesus became a high priest was because he was in submission to the will of the Father. Jesus Christ is co-equal with God. He is God. But God the Father wanted God the Son. It was His will that God the Son surrendered to when He came to earth and became a man and when He ultimately became sin and died on the cross. And we're going to see that when Jesus prayed and uh, asked for the Father uh, to... I let this cup pass from him. Verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offer up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears on him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he were feared, verse 8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. You and I cannot understand everything that Jesus Christ did when he went to the cross, which is one of the reasons, incidentally, that I'm not terribly into... Uh, the passion uh, or the, the emphasis of the passion of Christ, that is, the events that led up to the cross, which, though terrible, <clears throat> paled in comparison with the insult of the perfect Son of God being made sin. Amen. In other words, the lashing by the cat of nine tails, the mocking, the scorn, the disrespect, the betrayal, the abandonment that Jesus Christ suffered on His way to the cross was so that He could relate to the suffering of men. Because men can also suffer. But the work of the cross, my friend, the effectiveness of the cross is when Jesus Christ took God's wrath, the full force of it. Amen. Took the direction, you could say the misdirection, but the redirection of God's wrath onto Himself. You say, Pastor, when the Bible says that he was answered, he, he was heard, in that he feared. What does that mean? Well, it means God understood. That's what, what it means. The Scripture says, Thou wilt not keep my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer my flesh to see corruption. And I certainly am not saying that Jesus Christ bodily, physically went to hell. But Jesus Christ, my friend, was raised from the dead. And I believe there's an implication about the resurrection here. In other words, God raised him up. You say, Pastor, you fully understand everything in verse 7. You understand everything when Jesus prayed and said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nobody does. I've heard some inspiring sermons by people who made up things that they thought it meant. 
but that's all it is. The reality of it is that God's the only one that really understood what it meant to become a man. But we're told here in Hebrews, we're told here in Hebrews that when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears on him that were saved, we are also told in verse 8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he had suffered. A friend, I want to remind you that if you were to go back into Judaism as in the time that this letter was written, you would be going back to being under the ministry of a high priest who's taken from men, who could relate from men because he is every bit as sinful as they are. And when he offers a sacrifice for them, if he does so legitimately, then he is offering a sacrifice for himself because he needs one himself. But that is in contrast with the Son of God who came and became a man and who suffered all things for men. And though uh, he, as he is suffering and as he's praying for God uh, to, to uh, have mercy on him and not to make him what man is. See, my friend, if you think that Jesus wanted to become sin, you misunderstand how offensive sin is to God. Amen. You and I can't wrap our minds around, really, how offensive sin is to God. And as Jesus is coming to be made sin for men, it's not the suffering of the cross. I think that perhaps it's not even so much the fact that God turned His back on Him, but a large part of the insult of the cross is becoming sin, which is an outrage to holy God. It's the very thing that God is holy against. And it's a thing that He asked His Son to do. And the Bible says He became obedient. He was obedient. Now friend, I ask you, which is a better high priest? It's almost a sarcasm. It's almost an overstatement or an understatement, isn't it? To the point of being positively ridiculous. To go and to kneel before an individual who is an imposter. Not chosen by God because God chose His Son so that He could go to God for you. And He can't do a thing for Himself and He's just like you are. Versus the Son of God who though He is the polar opposite of who you are. See, the fact is that who Jesus is is against everything that I am. And when Jesus became sin for me, He became everything that He hates. But He did so so that He could take the wrath of God in my place. Who's a better priest? Who's a better priest? See, it almost is one of those things that to say it just seems ridiculous, isn't it? To even come out and say Jesus is better than the high priest imposter is ridiculous. And friend, today, to go in back into a religion, to go back away from following Jesus. Well, Pastor, you know, I've just, I just always loved the ritual of, of, you know, of Romanism, or I've always loved Mormonism, or I've always loved whatever it is. And you know, I just I wonder if it would be such a terrible thing. I believed in Jesus. I wonder if it would be such a terrible thing just to attend a Mass. I wonder if it would be just such a terrible thing to just to go back to a Seder and do a Seder. I wonder, we ought to be careful as Christians. We ought to be careful as Christians with the whole Judaism thing. There are Christians who are positively fascinated by the false Passover. And when they celebrate the Passover, they're willing to celebrate like a false religion celebrates it instead of the way that a believer ought to celebrate it. It's dangerous. Dangerous. Because, my friend, you are going and putting yourself or making yourself subservient. I know, I know Jewish believers whose family says, come, come to the Passover with us. Come to the Passover with us. Come to this with us. Come to that with us. Come do these things with us. And they go back and they do it and they put themselves in a system that is altogether in every way inferior to Jesus. What an affront to the perfect Son of God. What an insult to the Son of God. And here we are just plainly shown Jesus is in every way superior. Now I mentioned the, the uh, passage about Melchizedek, but we're going to have to go there next week because we're out of time this evening. So we'll be in Psalm 110 next week and we'll be introduced to Melchizedek. And I'd like you to think about 
the, what we mentioned this week as you study Hebrews. I'd like you to think about Jesus and Melchizedek and think about why it is that Melchizedek was a superior priest to a Levitical high priest. Why was it that Abraham, who had in his loins, who had the Le Levitical wine in him, himself was under Melchizedek, okay? And so you theophany folks can have a great time. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and dismiss with prayer or finish our, our service this time of prayer. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening. And I just thank you so much for Jesus who's superior in every way. God, please help us when we are tempted to, to not believe or tempted by unbelief and help us. God, when we're tempted to look to religion or ritual or something that's altogether inferior to Jesus, to realize that Jesus is better in every way and we want nothing but Jesus. We pray in His name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take some prayer requests this evening before we dismiss. It's important for us to have time that we that we pray for and with one another. And so let's go ahead and, and uh, share a prayer request at this time.